you'll know the classic line out of the movie Forrest Gump, where it says, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get next. And there's actually a fair bit of truth in that statement, isn't there? And even for some of us this week, just this week, we can attest to that. Things just come up. (laughs) One day, life is sweet. The next day, it's sour. One moment, you can be enjoying pleasant things. The next moment, you're having to endure painful things. That's life. How do you cope when it's like that? Is there any explanation for it being like that? Well, the disciples, they knew something of this experience. Uh, One day, everything was going swimmingly, we might say, and then the next day, it was going drowningly. How do we explain that? Why is it like that? If we just look back uh, a few verses, our focus this morning is verse 16 onwards, but have a look at verse 6 of John chapter 6. We're told here that this is uh, just after the large crowd has been with Jesus all day, they brought nothing for lunch, Jesus asks Philip, where can we get lunch for everybody? We're told Jesus says this to him as a test. It's a test. To test what? (laughs) What's the test for? Well, the test is not how well does Philip know the local area and where are the good shops to go and buy bread from. (laughs) The test is not How well can the disciples get together and raise some funds quick enough to have lunch for everybody to to, to buy enough bread? The test is not uh, a test of the disciples' pragmatic and administrative abilities in order to coordinate a large crowd. That's not the test. What's the test? The test is this. It's twofold, I think. The test is, number one, do they realise who Jesus is? And then secondly, do they trust him as they should? That's the test. Now, do you think the disciples passed the test? Well, I think if you had have asked them, they would have said, easily, (laughs) we easily passed this test. I mean, just have a look at what we've done here. Yep, Jesus does a miracle, but the disciples, well, first of all, it was Andrew who found the little boy. With the, with the little lunch. Uh, secondly, it was the disciples who Jesus got uh, to organise everybody and sit them down in groups. And after Jesus had multiplied and multiplied and then multiplied again the food, he gave it to the disciples to distribute to all the different groups um, until all the, all the, the... We're told and we saw last week the 5,000 men plus their families that eaten as much as they could. And it was the disciples who, after being told by Jesus to do so, they go around, they collect up all the leftovers, 12 baskets full, far more than they started with. Jesus has done the miracle, yes, but the disciples, they're they're right up there. They have a significant role to play here. They're sort of the in-between, going in between Jesus and the people. They would have felt, as John said last week, pretty good about themselves. They, um, they've played, not the main part, but a key part in a, in a mass miracle. We've passed the test, surely. If this is what it's like to follow Jesus, bring it on. <laughs> this is a picnic, they said, literally and metaphorically. <laughs> What's the next test? Well, not so fast, fellas. <laughs> not so fast. The reality is, they hadn't passed the test. They hadn't realised who Jesus 
really is, nor that they can trust him in all things. And so it's out of kindness to them and out of compassion to the disciples, I'm sure, that Jesus does not give them much time for their heads to get too big. And like any good teacher whose students don't get it the first time, he has another lesson for them. It's the same point, but taught in a different way. So verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. And we're told in both Matthew and Mark's accounts that it was Jesus who made them get into the boat and head off without him. And then John adds, it was now dark. Darkness, in John's Gospel, usually alludes to something being not good. And Jesus had not yet come to them. They're on their own, they're in the dark, and they're out at sea. And for a Jew, uh, the sea was usually not a good place to be. The sea was where chaos and disorder ruled, according to their superstition. Uh, The sea was where the demons lived and the evil spirits lived. And so the sea, it was a dangerous place to be, supernaturally. Uh, Let alone when nature itself is against you, which, as it turns out, it was here. Verse 18, the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. And uh, perhaps you've heard it before, but the Sea of Galilee uh, had and still has the capacity for violent winds to erupt out of nowhere, um, you know, according you know, due to the geography of the area, the mountains that are around, and the fact that it's below sea level, and uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just out of nowhere, violent storms can come. People drowned <laughs> in the Sea of Galilee, and so the disciples they start rowing for their lives here. Verse nineteen. When they had rowed about three or four miles, and again, if you add to it Matthew and Mark's account, they've been doing this for about eight hours at least, and that's how far they'd gotten. They're in the middle of the lake, straining at the oars, going nowhere, exhausted. And I don't imagine that they were all in the boat having a wonderful time. I can't imagine that someone pipes up and says, how about, how, fellas, how about we just all get together and sing a chorus? Uh, the wind beneath my wings, or something like that. And, and someone, well, yes, I just want to dedicate this next song to Jesus. Did you ever know that you were my hero? That's not what they're saying. They might be saying, well, the last time we were in this sort of circumstance, at least Jesus was with us. I mean, sure, he was asleep in the boat, but he was with us. Where is he now? What's going to happen? Will they be just another statistic of a lost boat and drowned men in the Sea of Galilee? Well, if that wasn't bad enough to cement their fear at three or four o'clock in the morning, they see this figure walking on the water walking on these rough waves and coming near the boat. (laughs) What else could it be other than an evil spirit? And I think in a quite sort of typical biblical understatement, (laughs) verse 19, and they were frightened. They were panic struck. How's their trust going now? See, life can be, to add another metaphor, like a a roller coaster. Up one minute and down the next. Yesterday at lunchtime, in the brightness of the day, things were fantastic. (laughs) Thousands of people fed and the the disciples (laughs) 
really right in the middle of it. By 3 a.m. the next morning in the pitch black, right in the middle of the lake, almost ready to go under with evil spirits chasing them, (laughs) it's frightening. Yesterday, everything seemed delightful. Now everything seems dreadful. It's gone from picnic to panic. And that's life, isn't it? (laughs) That's life. Yesterday, all my troubles seemed so far away. I had to. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. (laughs) It can be like that. (laughs) There is truth there. One day you were enjoying enjoying a party. (laughs) Next day there's a knock at the door and it's the police. Sorry, I have some bad news for you. One day, it's celebrating joyous news. The next day, it's a phone call from the doctor with the diagnosis. Sorry, it's terminal. One situation terrific, one terrible. Life is a mix. (laughs) It's a mix of pleasant things and painful things. How do we explain that? And how do we cope when it's like that? Just say, well, (laughs) life's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. End of story. Or maybe we're just left singing, oh, I believe in yesterday. I don't even know what that means. (laughs) Is that the best we can do? Well, some Christians try to explain it by saying, that, well, the good things come from God. The bad things come from the devil. The nice things, they come from heaven, but the the difficult things, well, they come from hell. And if there's something going on that I really enjoy, well, that's from God. And if there's something going on that's wrong or hard, well, that's the devil. And so you hear, hear preachers say things like God does not want you to be sick. He wants everyone to be healthy and rich. He doesn't want anybody to suffer. He just wants to bless you. The bad stuff, well, that comes from the devil. The good stuff comes from God. That's, that's how some people explain it. And it's not true. It's not how God explains it. Uh, Others will say, well, the bad things you experience are a direct result of your sin and disobedience. And the good things you you enjoy are a result of your obedience and and faith. Well, that's not true either. (laughs) The disciples' predicament was not on account of their disobedience. In fact, they were in the predicament they were in because they were obedient to Jesus. And it's, that's important to realise because it's, it, it saves us from the thinking that, well, as long as you're obedient and faithful, everything will be hunky-dory. And if you're obedient, well, you hardly need to row at all. In fact, the, the boat pretty well just rows itself. <laughs> but if you're disobedient, you'll really find yourself straining at the oars. And again, you'll hear preachers say things like, well, if you just sow the seeds of your faith uh, into this bank account, <laughs> there's, there's no knowing how much God will bless you. Because really, God just wants you to have this really excellent life. And he really just wants to bless you and give you all this great stuff because at the end of the day, you're really awesome. Well, uh, the disciples were awesome, but oar some. <laughs> There's only one character in this story who's awesome, A-W-E, awesome. And I think the first thing that we see to explain what's going on here is the providence of Jesus. We see the providence of Jesus. 
So if I was to ask you, um, who initiated the conversation here about, about the lunch? Well, Jesus did. Who told the people to sit down? Jesus did. Who took the bread and, and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied it? Jesus did. Who told the disciples what to do and how to distribute it? Jesus did. Who sent the disciples to the boat and told them to head off without him? Jesus did. Who told the wind when to blow and how hard to blow? Jesus did. The picture here is not Satan running the world or blind fate. It's Jesus. Jesus is running the show here. He's not competing with Satan. He's completing his sovereign will. He's running the show, including the, the chaotic and disordered sea. Satan is just his servant. We're not held in the, in the grip of blind fate. See, it's Jesus who does the miracle. And it's Jesus who calls the storm. The same Jesus. The same Jesus who sent the disciples out to distribute and then gather same Jesus who sent them into the lake. Jesus is as much in the centre of the free lunch that fed everybody yesterday as he is in the centre of the storm here at 3 and the next morning. Both are equally from his hand. And he knew, he knew, he knew the disciples would be distressed. He knew that they'd be frightened and he knew that they'd be questioning, well, where, where, where is Jesus? Now, why did he send us into this situation? Well, that's just the question. That's, that's the question. That's the point. Why did he do it? Why did Jesus do it? Because he knew there was something the disciples needed to learn there was something that they'd learn in the storm that they'd never learn in the free lunch Jesus knew there was something so important that the, that the disciples needed to know that they didn't get the day before but they're going to get it now they needed to learn who Jesus really is and they needed to learn that they should really trust him. Their view of Jesus needed to be bigger and their trust of Jesus needed to be bigger. See, at the end of the, the feeding miracle, look, the people are impressed. Uh, this, indeed, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into, into the world, they say, in verse 14, that's impressive. But that estimation is not enough. It's not enough for who Jesus is. Jesus is not just another Moses. I mean, sure, they want to make him king, verse 15. But what sort of king? Well, the king who would give them all the good stuff that they wanted. <laughs> that's the sort of king. Not a king who might be lord over my life. Well, their view, it's, just, it's not enough. <laughs> not nearly enough for who Jesus is. What sort of king do you want Jesus to be for you? Yeah, you know, a king who will give me health and wealth and, and security. <laughs> a king to make sure Australia gets uh, back to the way it should be. If we just had a king like that, then, well, that view of Jesus is not enough. It's not good enough when it comes to Jesus. Jesus, he, he's saying, I'm more than those things. He's the one who can create out of nothing. He's the one who can walk on the rough sea. This Jesus, he's the Lord of creation. He's the king of glory. There is no other God 
like this God. And Job, in Job chapter 9, verse 8, he asked the question, Who is he who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea? Well, Jesus, that's who. That's who it is. Which is why, uh, for instance, uh, one thing, when your friends are asking, you know, why, why, why are you so into Jesus? Why are you so focused on just this one person? I mean, why can't you just acknowledge that there are other people who, who have done and do great things? Why can't you acknowledge that there are other people who have said great things? There are other people who believe, believe other things. There are, there are a lot of others who have different answers. Why are you so, so just myopic about this Jesus character? Why can't you just broaden your interests? Well, the answer is because Jesus has not left that option open to us. He has not left us with the option of him being one among many, or even one among several. He is like no one else, and no one else is like him. The song we sang uh, last week, maybe we should have sung, sung it this week, he is the word of God, the Father. From before the world began, every star and every planet has been fashioned by his hand. With a prayer, he fed the hungry, and with a word, he stilled the sea. That's who Jesus is. In fact, it would be a surprise if he didn't come walking on the water, wouldn't it? Jesus puts the disciples in this situation out of, really, out of compassion to show them who he really is and to show them that they can trust him. Why does he put certain storms in your life? Well, I can't answer that in the detail. <laughs> why this particular storm at this particular time and for this duration. But we do know the big picture. And the big picture is that everything Jesus does is to show how great he is. And everything he does is to make us trust him. You can try and explain the mess of life and the mix in life some other way, but... I'm sticking with the words of William Cooper. I mean, you know the words, don't you? God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in his dark and hidden minds, with never-failing skill, he fashions all his bright designs and works his sovereign will. O oh, fearful saints... New courage take, the clouds that you now dread are big with mercy and will break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. It was the providence, we might even add the purposeful providence, of Jesus that took them into the storm so that they would see who he really is and know that they can really trust him. And so we say, what mercy, what compassion from Jesus to do that? And so what about the storms in your life then? Do you thank Jesus for taking you into storms? Easier to say than do. But those storms are not accidents. And at the end of the day, all that Jesus does is so that he can say, be still and know that I am God. Well, it's great relief, <laughs> great relief to know that all of life is under the hand of Jesus. But that's not all we can say. There's actually more we can say. There's more to the story. 
not only can we rest in the purposeful providence of Jesus, but we can also rest in the presence of Jesus, the presence of Jesus. See, not only does Jesus walk on the water to show the disciples who he is, uh, he speaks to them. He says, it is I, do not be afraid. And he gets into the boat with them. I mean, this, it's a wonderful picture of how Jesus deals with his people. Nobody else, nobody else can really get into your circumstances in the way that Jesus does. Your spouse, your kids, your friends, your parents, nobody in the world can, can fully understand you. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him, uh, Paul says. Who knows what it's like? Well, nobody except Jesus. He knows, and in our circumstances, whatever they might be, Jesus comes and he enters in and he speaks words of kindness. And this, this Jesus here, he comes into the darkness of their experience and he, he doesn't come and give them a lecture. <laughs> he doesn't come and say, well, you guys, what are you doing? You, you, you should have known better than this. Didn't you get the miracle? You just saw, saw a great miracle and now you're goofing around on the water. No, no, he comes and says, it's me. It's me, it's Jesus. Don't be afraid. Be still and know that I am God. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. It, another miracle. <laughs> One after the other. One second straining at the oars in the middle of the lake, the next second safely at their destination. And again, I think it's a picture. It's a picture of, it's God's way of saying, when Jesus is with you, well, he'll get you <laughs> to where he wants you. He'll get you to where he wants you. And guess what? <clears throat> well, for all those who belong to Jesus, for all those who are called by him and loved by him, Jesus is with you. He's with you. And so we can say, Jesus is our strength and refuge, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, We will not fear. <laughs> though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, the Lord of hosts is with us. Well, not only has Jesus ordained the storm for good, but he says, I'm with you in the storm. There's no, nobody else like Jesus. Nobody even comes close. So Jesus says, I'm with you. I'm with you in the storm. He, that's Jesus' promise. Jesus never, ever, ever leaves his children. Not for a second. Not once. He's with you. Even when you fail the tests. <laughs> even when you fail the tests time and time again, like the disciples. He says, I'm with you. And see, so when you know Jesus is there, well, it makes all the difference, doesn't it? When you know Jesus is with you and his purpose, purposefully providencing hand is upon you, then the storm's not, so, not quite as bad, is it? It's when you're alone and in the dark, that's when the storm can over, be overpowering. But Jesus says, I'm with you, I have not deserted you. I don't know if you... Realise what um, a couple of guys were talking about it this week in a Bible study. One of the most common commands in all of Scripture is do not fear. 
It said time and time, do not fear, do not be afraid. Now, how can you do that when life's such a mess? Well, in a pretty mixed up and messed up world, it takes nothing less than knowing the providence of Jesus and the presence of Jesus to be able to do that. You're not going to make sense of this world unless you make, first make sense of Jesus. But when you do make sense of Jesus and get the big things right, then it puts the little things in perspective. Now, I, I, I don't know what it would have been like here once the, the boat sort of just there at the shore and there they are, they're safe, they're there, instantly calm. I'd imagine there'd just be some that, you know, the disciples probably a bit sheepish. <laughs> there'd be that awkward silence of, you know, what, what do you say now? <laughs> what, 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 what would you say? Would you say, uh, Jesus, you know, should I get the rope or will I just leave that for you? <laughs> or, you know, you might want to break the awkward silence by someone saying, well, uh, anyone for a sandwich? <laughs> We've got plenty of leftovers here, guys. What would you say? Well, we know from Matthew's account that what was said is truly, this is the Son of God. What else would you say? Now, I don't know what they said other than that or after that. But I reckon if it wasn't on their lips, I reckon this certainly would have been on their hearts, this question. The question would have been, Why did we ever doubt? Why did we ever doubt Jesus? And at the end of the day, that's what we'll we'll find ourselves saying. (laughs) Why did we ever doubt? Why did we ever doubt Jesus? He showed himself time and time again to be so glorious, so gracious, so unlike anybody else, so trustworthy, Why did we ever doubt his greatness or his goodness? Well, because of Jesus' purposeful providence and because of his presence, there's absolutely no chance that you won't be exactly where Jesus wants to get you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for every little picture we get of the Lord Jesus. And so for the picture that we've seen this morning, really our prayer is quite simple. Our prayer is, give us a bigger view of the Lord Jesus and give us a bigger trust of him. We ask for our sake and for his sake, And in his name, amen.